My name is Milena Vakletska-Dutski and I represent Wonderland Foundation located in Budapest, Hungary. We are very happy to be part of the project No Borders Photo Award for Young Photographers. Young people and children are main target groups of all our activities. Our goal is to promote art, culture and innovative learning among children, youth, their parents and educators. To fulfill those goals, we create and organize events for children. One of the examples is Wonderland Art and Creativity Festival for children organized in Poland and Hungary. The festival was a three weeks event that contained of exhibition presenting Polish and Hungarian children book illustrations and design and also several workshops delivered by Polish and Hungarian artists. Last year the foundation was mainly involved in preparing educational materials for children, the parents and teachers. We have published two interactive cooking books for children where we promote Polish and Hungarian cuisine as well as their cultures and traditions. We always put a lot of effort to make our publications nicely designed with eye-catching illustrations and interesting exercises for children. That is why we cooperate with talented illustrators and graphic designers from Europe. This year we are involved in different kinds of online events and seminars and we work on four publications for children and educators. And now I am very happy to invite you to the Portfolio Review by Tomoya Imamura. I hope you will enjoy the time and learn as much as possible from that presentation. Hello everybody. Uh, welcome on the second part on, um, of the portfolio review, online portfolio review, uh, where we meet uh, with Tomoya Imamura, uh, the expert from the Hungarian part. Hello, Tomoya. Oh. <laughs> and um, so, so the, the brief introduction, who we are, what are we doing here? Mm, we are the uh, No Borders uh, Photography Exhibition Award. And uh, this is the award and the contest for young participants for Visha from Visegrad countries and Ukraine that can um, submit their photos in five categories, uh, five single image categories, um, portrait, which we are reviewing at the moment, uh, landscape, street photography, uh, creative and document, um, as well as the series of images. Uh, for all the participants, uh, we have uh, many um, beautiful rewards and one of them is participation in the Portfolio Review uh, live during Photo Art Festival in Bielsko Biała. Uh, you can win a, a solo exhibition, the production of a solo exhibition, um, if you are lucky. Uh, but uh, most of all, there will be a, select, a group exhibition uh, traveling all over uh, these five countries uh, that are our partners. Uh, so this time we already have, uh, I was the, the lucky reviewer who reviewed a series of images categories. And uh, at the moment we have uh, Tomoya Imamura from Hungary, selected by Wonderland Alepitvan, the foundation uh, that is uh, our partner from Budapest. And he will be talking about the portrait section, the portrait category section, and some works uh, that, have, that have been submitted there. Uh, I also wanted to mention uh, that the submission is still open until September, and you can find all the information in the, um, uh, on our website. Uh, you can see the link below. Um, as well as on Facebook, the uh, social media for old people. <laughs> um, uh, what else? And search for our, like, we have uh, great reviewers, photographers uh, from Visegrad countries, and not only uh, mentioning that uh, Tomoya Imamura has a very uh, diverse uh, background and um, I'm very happy to meet you today. Tomoya was already present during the lecture about uh, the po portraits uh, for our participants and I'm really looking forward for what he's going to say, what kind of tips and what uh, about photography he's going to give you all and us all. And um, 
welcome to Moya. I would like to start with a little presentation of your work and uh, your work uh, as an artist, because uh, like we were just wondering that, okay, we have saw some of your photos, and uh, but but still you didn't have your own presentation at our yeah. contest. Okay, I will start off with that then. Uh, Maybe another important um, information is that uh, during Photo Art Festival in Bielsko Biała uh, this year uh, in uh, October, you can not only uh, see uh, Tomoya directly, but you can see his works from uh, the series Pet of His Corpse that I hope you will be talking about now. <laughs> okay. Yes, uh, hello, my name is uh, Tomoya Yamura and uh, for my background, uh, I should probably say that uh, my mother is Hungarian. I am a Hungarian citizen and I do speak Hungarian if the question arises. Uh, my father is Japanese and I was born and raised in Germany. That's also where I am uh, right now. And yes, I will be talking about uh, my work Petrifi's Corps. My work generally revolves around the uh, theme of nationalism in Europe, but uh, specifically uh, the forming of the Hungarian national self-image of the Hungarian national identity. I usually combine documentary images with uh, staged images, where the idea is that the edges sort of bleed into each other and you're never quite sure, you're never quite sure what part is staged, what part is uh, documented. For the sake of time, I will be mostly showing my work, which is this series, Petrifi's Corpse, which is also the one I will be showing in uh, Bielsko Biała. And this work is about the uh, post-socialist uh, present in Hungary and its connection to the rise of nationalism. And basically about the revival and reinvention of the country's own national identity after communism. It's specifically about Hungary, but traces of it will probably be familiar to other Eastern European, Central European uh, countries as well. In this series, uh, I've called it uh, Petrifi's Corpse because it's a reference to uh, Sándor Petrifi was the national poet of the Hungarian revolution against the Austrian Empire in 1848. The thing is, his death was never fully cleared, so we don't know if he died in battle, if he died while fleeing, or if he died in captivity. And this uncertainty around his death is sort of an allegory for the uncertainty of the Hungarian self-image somewhere between the uh, historically suppressed nation and uh, the greatest place on earth with the most beautiful woman. In the series, I also use a paper mache objects, as you can see here, which uh, usually represent uh, communist symbols or Hungarian national symbols, uh, which find their way into everyday situations. Now, most of the viewers will probably understand the communist symbols like Lenin, for example, in this case, but they will have problems understanding the Hungarian national symbols. Uh, all they will probably understand is that they have some kind of meaning because they are being highlighted. Now, on a uh, visual level, they uh, work sort of as burnt out holes in the images, photographically speaking, uh, because they are white, Color is missing, and uh, usually in a photograph, white spots usually mean uh, overexposure. So there is information missing uh, on a visual level, but also maybe for outsiders on a symbolic level. Another re recurring element in the images is uh, the one kilogram loaf of bread, which is sort of a standardized mass product which still feels very communist, but it also has a Christian symbolism, obviously, because bread is the body of Christ, and it, this is supposed to describe the connection between the church and the nationalist movement. 
in uh, connection with the title Petofi's Corpse, it also highlights Petofi himself as sort of a messiah of uh, the new national identity, especially the aspect of it, which is sort of in a perpetual victimhood. Because in the time of Petofi, it was true that there, was, there were centuries of uh, foreign oppression but today it's more of a tool, uh, weapon, weaponized tool uh, to give the Hungarian people a feeling of always having a suppressor, I believe at least. But the series also references certain shifts in this kind of historical focus, uh, historical self-image, where people start to look for other references in history and thereby also other other ways of seeing themselves. And in the end, uh, it sort of incorporates a very valid feeling of disappointment, basically, a disappointment about the lost hopes of capitalism, which is supposed to say that whatever is being criticized in this series is also subjectively understandable. Now, I will also show you Uh, I will also show you some of my work in progress, uh, which will be my new series called uh, Born with Teeth, uh, which is about a very specific aspect of Hungarian uh, culture, Hungarian history, and uh, sort of connects to the uh, series before. The title itself, uh, Born with Teeth, uh, references a pagan superstition which mean, which says that a child born with teeth is destined to be a Tartosh, which is a sort of shaman, a sort of uh, witch doctor, if you like, if shaman is how it's pronounced at all. And uh, the series itself uh, revolves around uh, the revival of uh, pagan culture, of the uh, ancient Hungarian culture of the people who came uh, to the Carpathian Basin over a thousand years ago, who were nomadic people from uh, Central Europe and uh, therefore also pagan. But there is a growing movement in Hungary uh, which tries to revive uh, this ancient culture, although there is very little uh, historical scientific uh, evidence left, but they are still trying to revive uh, traditions such as uh, archery, horseback archery, shamanism, uh, and the symbols uh, of that period. In this series, again, I'm... Uh, looking for places, looking for people that reference this culture. For example, here is a, the one in the middle is a uh, monument uh, for Attila, Attila de Han, who the Hungarian people, much like the Turkish people as well, view as their ancestors. Uh, Hans also were pagan people, but centuries before the pagan Hungarian uh, tribes uh, came to Europe, but still they saw a sort of connection between the Huns and the Hungarian uh, tribes. Much like in the series before, I'm also combining documentary images with staged images. In this case, the staged images refer to uh, specific Hungarian legends and uh, as I said, this is a work in progress, so uh, maybe you will be seeing images that will not make the cut at, in the end. I'm also showing aspects of everyday life in Hungary, such as the monuments that are being built, and also this kind of rune scripture, for example, uh, which has very little vague uh, historical scientific uh, references 
but is being uh, displayed at the entrance of uh, towns and villages after the signs for the village itself it has the same sign in the rune scripture for example and it's i feel basically a way to uh, emancipate the hungarian identity from uh, the perpetual cycle of uh, failed revolutions i believe at least uh, i get the feeling that this is a way for the hungarian people to find a uh, historical reference that is not just about uh, revolution but something they i believe seem to be more proud of for me personally it's interesting because coincidentally i am half japanese half hungarian so geographically that sets a point in central asia where the hungarian people derive from so uh, sort of in a poetic way i might look like uh, somewhat original hungarian who came from skiffia uh, back a thousand years ago and uh, this is sort of a poetic interesting uh, coincidence that drew me to this uh, specific time period uh, as a starting point so to say but it draws into the uh, whole theme of uh, national identity and the historical references that uh, build up our our understanding of ourselves as a last image from this series uh, for now this is, for example, a staged image that references the uh, most uh, ancient tale of the Hungarian uh, origin, where two Scythian princes uh, were on a hunt, uh, hunting a miraculous deer, a sort of very fancy deer, uh, for a long time, and it led them towards the west. Eventually, they uh, lost track of the deer, but they found a land uh, that made them uh, leave uh, Scythia, Central Asia, and lead their people towards the west, which is what paved the way for the Hungarian nation to arise later on. Those princes were also called uh, Hunor and Magot, which references the Huns and the Magyars. The and uh, is supposed to highlight the connection between the two people. In this regard, I also wanted to show the book that uh, I've made for the series Petrifi's Corpse. Uh, I only have two left, that's why it's good. Is this is a video, usually, I wouldn't have the chance to show it. Uh, it's also supposed to show the connection between the bread on the title and the uh, Petrifi, Petrifi's Corpse. On the title it's german i'm sorry it was german work originally but the first page is in hungarian this book uh, formally is uh, connected to an old uh, petrify book my grandmother got as a pupil back in 1956 in the year of the revolution coincidentally uh, what you can see about this is that it doesn't have a cover anymore and it only has uh, the, uh, what the Germans call the dirt cover, which is the cover under the cover, because in older times, uh, books were only made with the dirt cover and you would bring them to a bookbinder afterwards to have a, a custom cover made for your books, your Bible or so forth. So in the uh, production of this book, which I bound myself, that's why there weren't as many to begin with. I've tried to emulate this, uh, dirt cover look and uh, the bread on the cover is a specific stamp I've made for this specifically yeah and what you can also see is the fact that I've used two colors in the production of the book two colors that also uh, play a role in the images you will see them uh, repeat inside the images themselves one is a uh, sort of a socialist mint green, which is present in a lot of uh, old socialist buildings. The other one is a faded orange, which is supposed to reference a uh, post-socialist style of painting houses inspired by well, a Mediterranean orange, inspired by uh, 
the telenovelas that became very popular after communism, probably not just in uh, Hungary, but also in other Eastern European countries. Which brings us to my portrait review. I'm calling it a portrait review because it's not really a portfolio, more of a, a single image review. And I've chosen a handful of images from all the images I've got. And much like Kasia, I uh, chose them for educational purposes more than anything else. It's not necessarily about uh, the best or the worst images, more about images I can basically talk about and uh, say something about. Usually I don't have any context for these images, so it's mostly about uh, what I can see in the images themselves. For some, I do have some kind of background information, but you will see later on. First off, we have uh, Emilia Martin, who photographed a lesbian couple in intimate embrace, which also means that for all the Hungarian viewers, uh, your discretion is advised. It is my little poke at the Hungarian government. But I'm assuming that uh, in Polish society, the uh, Polish government also isn't in love with uh, homosexuality. So what this means for this specific image is that the uh, gaze of the girl in front is sort of a confrontation with the camera, with the viewer. And uh, it's supposed to show that she is not ashamed of being homosexual. And uh, this is also the main focus of this image, uh, the main message, I guess. All in all, the composition is very good as well. The lighting, everything is very good. The only grievance I might have with this image is that uh, it stages intimacy, which is generally an antithetical thing, uh, which isn't generally a problem, but at, because I know it is a staged image, I start to look at the people and feel like they are acting, which is specifically weird with the girl in the back, because she seems to be very much into the situation while the uh, girl in front is more preoccupied with confronting us. It's probably also about the surroundings because this is not a situation you would just stumble into and photograph or if you would you wouldn't be this close this uh, upfront about it because it would be an intrusion into a personal space now i i imagine this would be sort of an, a place where they secretly meet or a personal space where they uh, usually meet and also this means there would usually not be a camera around as an example for this, I have picked uh, Tobias Siloni, who also photographs uh, young people in their natural surroundings. And uh, it's also sort of a private space, but it's also a place where you are not surprised about the camera being present. Actually, if you look at the series he produces, at some point you start to forget that there is a photographer present who's uh, in their personal space and you just start to uh, concentrate on the images themselves. So the only uh, suggestion I would have basically is uh, trying to balance uh, staging and intimacy, which is very hard, I know. And maybe by uh, changing the framing or changing the surroundings, uh, to a situation that feels uh, less of an intrusion, or maybe if you are in a very personal space, try to balance uh, the situation with how you approach the image so as to uh, not get this feeling of staging, not get this feeling of uh, acting on some parts. Uh, next up, we have uh, Adrian Jozan who sent us an, a self-portrait uh, of herself after chemotherapy, which is a very emotional theme itself. So she made a very good decision by closing her eyes, which is the exact opposite of we, what we saw in the last image. And it helps because the theme itself is quite emotional, but she avoids this kind of confrontation, which would make it even more emotional. And she also just, by closing her eyes, doesn't draw away attention from the general composition of the image. On a 
pragmatic level, it also shows that her lashes are missing as well, which is something you don't necessarily think about when uh, thinking of chemotherapy and its consequences. By closing her eyes, it also homogenizes the image to where you start looking more at the texture of the skin and the uh, composition of the image itself. By uh, drawing away the focus, you start looking at details on the skin uh, where the color is slightly different, or for example, the bruises she has on her neck. There's also a very uh, subtle but important uh, choice in this uh, portrait, which is that the color temperature is slightly warmer, just a few points, but it uh, changes the perception of the image uh, to a more lively uh, perception, which is a very subtle but very important, very good choice, in my opinion. Then we have uh, Esther Rossoni, who sent us a portrait of her brother. And in this image, again, we have very good composition and very good use of uh, the light, lighting situation. I believe, in this case, it is the setting sun. What's also very good is the composition of the image, uh, because she uses uh, diagonals, which create dynamics in the image. Dynamics uh, create movement. But she also has a dynamic in depth, because uh, the person is leaning backwards slightly, so you have a uh, depth into the image as well. And also, Speaking about the general composition of the image, it's important that she left enough room uh, on the top because that's where the uh, composition is generally flowing. So uh, the person, the composition of the person, the movement of the person has somewhere to go, has enough room inside the image. And as I said, the uh, lighting is also very subtle, uh, creates a very sensible mood, a personal mood and uh, greatly contributes to the feeling of the image. Next up here is uh, Adam Goro, who made, made a more graphic image. Graphic in the sense that uh, it's more about shapes and how lighting uh, creates shapes in contrast with uh, shadow. Uh, the shadow itself comes from probably just having one light source but the shadow is also a divider in this image because it divides uh, the face in half. We ha again have a situation where the eyes are obstructed, so you look more at the shapes than uh, having a confrontation with the person in the image. And there is a very specific uh, little detail I find very important in this case, which is the slight highlight in the uh, left eye, which is in the shadow. But these few pixels, basically, give the viewer a feeling of texture, a feeling of, you, you have a feeling for the glossier eyeball, and it is really just a few pixels, but it uh, reveals a lot of information. So all in all, it's a good image with a great use of graphical uh, elements and a good composition all in all. Then we have uh, Veronica Kahn who made a basically nude photograph, an act photograph, uh, in what I believe is a personal space. Now, I don't know if this is the personal space of the person she photographed, but it nonetheless creates a, an intimate atmosphere. Again, we have a single light source from a window, probably. And uh, the elements in the room also contribute to the composition of the image. Uh, this light chain in particular is a, an important uh, diagonal divider, which again gives the image some kind of movement and uh, benefits the composition of the image. The only thing I would suggest is maybe incorporating the room more, because uh, if it is the personal space of the person you photograph, the room can sometimes reveal more than, for example, the uh, uh, the naked body itself could reveal, because it's uh, composed of a lot of uh, specific choices the person itself uh, makes. 
Also in this image, there is a very elegant solution uh, where she cut off the uh, image at the vagina. So you see a little bit more than you would usually see, but you see don't see too much. So there's a very elegant uh, solution if you want to uh, do nude photography where you don't pull any punches, but you don't make it pornographic in any way. And I have a, an example for incorporating uh, the rooms into a portrait by Eckhart Korn, who isn't necessarily known, but he made a great uh, series about 14 year old boys in their confirmation suits, and he always lets them pose in their own uh, private childhood rooms. And in this case, the room almost says more about the person than their faces in the image. And the uh, suits they are wearing are specifically not saying anything because they, ha they have to wear them. And this is contrasted uh, with the rooms that is saying a lot about them. And I believe uh, you could do the same thing probably with uh, nude photography. And I, in that case, I would probably leave out the fashion accessories because they reveal something that the room already does. And then you have a contrast between the uh, naked body and the fullness of the room and a contrast between the uh, information that each reveal, which leads to a dynamic in the image you could use. Now we have uh, Vaslav Sobek. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that somewhat right. I'm sorry if I don't. Uh, who has sent us an image that has a lot of good elements and uh, Particularly, I assume he chose this specific image because uh, coincidentally the person on the right is there and there is a contrast between the two people, which is also one of the interesting parts of the image itself. I'm assuming that's also the reason why he uh, chose this specific image. There might have been images that are better composed, but uh, there is a coincidental uh, dynamic here that he didn't want to pass on and I understand that completely. The problem this image has generally is that uh, there's a lot of clutter and clutter is a bit hard to compose in an image. There are a lot of uh, negative shapes which are the shapes between the shapes that don't add up but negative shapes have to be composed the same way that uh, positive forms have to be composed in an image. The solution I would suggest in a case like this is one that Shiori Kawamoto uses, uh, who is a Japanese photographer, and uh, she usually photographs uh, young women in Japan in their rooms, and these rooms are always cluttered to the brim. And she always has a framing where all of the image is cluttered, basically. This leads to the fact that all the clutter becomes noise. And you don't have the problem of composition anymore because uh, the whole image is noise and the person is sort of in between this noise as a uh, and uh, you don't have to compose the room itself so this is a suggestion if the next situation like this arises where you have a lot of clutter a lot of information in one image and you don't quite know how to uh, compose it just let it fill the frame entirely now we have uh, Marlena Maswowitz, who has made a very well executed, uh, highly staged image. Composition is good, the lighting is good, everything formally about this image is good. It's a good image, basically. My only problem with it is that uh, the messaging itself is a bit too on the nose. I feel like it's a bit too obvious. It's something about putting on a mask for society or putting on a smile because that's the expectation of society. On a technical level, uh, I don't like that the paper is rolling up in some places, which can be easily fixed by gluing them down the next time. This leads to me imagining her cutting out the uh, elements from paper, and this sort of breaks the surrealism of the image. But uh, going back to the uh, symbolism and the uh, analogies she wants to make, I have an example, which is Roger Ballon, who also does highly staged images, also black and white. Uh, he's an American photographer who mostly photographs in South Africa. And 
The difference is that his messaging, his symbols are not quite as clear. And this is a general thing in uh, contemporary art where you have symbolism, you have metaphors, and you understand them broadly. You understand the theme of the image, but you never specifically know what each symbol is supposed to specifically mean. So it becomes sort of an interaction with the viewer where the viewer himself has to interpret the image, he becomes an active participant. And this leads to the viewer also having to think a little bit more. So this is the only suggestion I would make is that uh, you should probably try to make these symbols and metaphors a little bit less obvious or give a little bit more room to interpret them. Yeah, but overall, the image was pretty good. Now we have an image by Agatha Kaputa. And this image I selected because I just like it. It's, it's a good image, and I believe it uh, illustrates that coincidences sometimes can lead to an image that's probably even better than the image you had in your mind beforehand. Uh, what we can see here is that you can see the uh, studio situation around the image. And uh, specifically, what I like about it is that the person is dead center, but the background is slightly off center and slightly diagonal, which gives it some kind of movement, a little bit of di uh, dynamic. And uh, by the pose, you can also see that the person wasn't probably quite ready to be photographed. Uh, as a side note, I would not use uh, watermarks. Just a suggestion. I, I wouldn't. I just wouldn't do it. Uh, another thing I like very much about this that you can see that she probably went through her hair just before the image was taken, and her face isn't quite uh, ready to be photographed as well, because there is a slight remnant of a smile uh, on her face still, and her eyes are slightly closed, which leads to them being sort of melancholic. And all of these are coincidences, which led to a very good portrait, in my opinion, it's supposed to illustrate that uh, coincidences can be used to have a better uh, image in the end than what you would have planned beforehand. Now, this is an image by Patrick Janota with multiple exposures. And from the images I've seen from him before, I would assume that this is an analog photograph. So he probably didn't have full control over the layering, over the composition, which is also the only thing I would suggest uh, changing, because it seems kind of random. But the idea itself is pretty good, because he tried to uh, combine multiple perspectives uh, of a face in one image which is also a sort of scientific method used in mugshots, for example, where the idea is that you have the maximum of amount of information about a person's face or head for more or less scientific uh, reasons. But it's also something that uh, Pablo Picasso did, uh, where he combined different angles, different perspectives of certain elements of the face in one portrait. This is just to supposed to be food for thought. So maybe the next time you do a composition like this with multiple exposures, uh, you can think about the references. Now here's uh, Marta Cosson, uh, who did a great portrait, uh, which also has a single light source, which is probably a window. And what this picture shows is that uh, we also have a kind of layering with this cloth, uh, which creates a depth to the image. And it's also always just interesting visually for the viewer to see that uh, within the image, there are different layers. In this case, the layer also catches the light of the sun. And this uh, highlights the uh, mood, the atmosphere she was trying to create, sort of nostalgic, sort of uh, melancholic. And uh, the cloth, the layering, uh, helps with this uh, creation of mood. And it's just uh, also a good way to make the image more interesting just visually. 
this image by Katarzyna Main. I selected because it is a good applied portrait with a lot of conscious decisions that work out very well. For example, the uh, clothing is very well matched uh, in color and texture with the environment, and uh, she used that, that very well. You can also see through the background because the plastic is opaque, so uh, you have a sense of the surrounding even behind the uh, background. And generally, the composition is very good, the lighting is very good. Uh, I feel like it's a slight slightly over sharpened for my taste but that's a question of taste and uh, as i said it would work very well in a magazine or as an editorial uh, portrait or something like this a lot of good choices clean good image uh, this image by alexander rostek rostek i uh, chose because it is very easy to fix in my opinion the thing with this image is that it's has a very dominant, uh, it has very dominant writing in it. And if you have writing in it, it has to mean something for the image. Now, I'm assuming this doesn't mean anything, but I might just not understand the language. Uh, either way, there is a slight problem with fleeing lines uh, with the perspective from, uh, from the bottom up, which is a general problem, a general uh, complication when you photograph architecture. That's also why a lot of uh, professional architecture photogra photographers uh, use uh, uh, full uh, format, big format cameras where you can uh, change the perspective of the image before you take it. But you can still correct this in Photoshop afterwards. And generally, I would say that anything that recreates the way you saw an image and uh, accounts for the uh, imperfections a camera has, the lens has, is an okay correction. But in this case, uh, I don't think it's a problem to just take about away, for example, that T. Because if you don't have a documentary focus, I don't believe it's necessarily wrong to just uh, cut out certain aspects you don't want in the image. Now here we have a cropping uh, where only the word more is visible, which still doesn't mean much, but it at least means uh, my, mine in masculine in French. Why not? And now it looks like a sort of a magazine cover or something. So now it uh, becomes sort of a fashion image. And also what it does, it highlights the reflection uh, in that right hand window more which is very interesting and maybe something to work with. Uh, coincidentally, a very interesting uh, distortion in that window. And as a last image, we have Agnieszka Bukowiecka, who just made a very good portrait, a very well composed image with a good depth, use, of, use of depth and uh, an interesting uh, use of layering with the shadow on the face, which again uh, creates sort of a graphical uh, element where forms uh, interconnect and uh, create layering, which is visually interesting for the viewer. Also, uh, on a technical level, she used the grayscaling very well, because with black skin, you sometimes have the problem that you lose information in the dark parts or in the uh, uh, lighter parts. But she uh, hit the amount of grayscaling very well because all of the information is there. She managed the shadow, she managed uh, the, darker, the darkest parts in the eyes very well. You still have the reflection in the eyes of herself standing in front of the person. So it's a very well executed image. And this was the last one in my presentation. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tomoya. Do you have any um, summarizing um, ideas about the whole contest and about the, 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 the different pictures that you have seen in the uh, portrait section, in the portrait category? 
Hmm? Well, I, I was uh, sort of surprised to see a, a lot of variants uh, between the images. So uh, the uh, uh, conclusion I can make is that really there is no single uh, approach to making portraits, but since we've seen a lot of very highly staged images and a lot of more documentary or report uh, photojournalistic images in a sense. Uh, so what I would suggest or say or give a tip to is that uh, if you uh, have a plan beforehand, that's good. But if a situation arises and uh, you can use that situation to your benefit or you have to adapt to the situation, use that for your image as well. We've seen all kinds of things, both this, both that, both in between. So uh, find your way. <laughs> OK, thank you um, for your review. Thank you, uh, participants, for sending us your photos. The contest is still open. And you have a chance to meet uh, Tomoya live during Photo Art Festival in October. And you also have a chance to participate in the group exhibition. Um, so please do, please check uh, our website and submit your photos and tell your friends about it and get recognized by Tomoya Imamura. And, get um... recognized by me. <laughs> also, if you, you have questions specifically about my uh, review or in general anything, you can contact me on Facebook or Instagram. But as we've stated before, Facebook is for old people, so <laughs> I won't check that as much. Yeah, and then we address the contest only uh, to people up to 35 years. So, ah. yeah, so check Tomoya on Instagram. Yeah. Uh, check his website. He has one as well. Um, and you can write to us, of course. Uh, so we will... Um, uh, we, we will forward the message uh, to Tomoya and good luck uh, to the participants uh, that, um, that they're submitting, that they're applying uh, to our contest and see you soon, hopefully. See you live. Yeah, see you. Thank you very much. Oh, I wanted to state as well that um, our our meeting uh, was funded <laughs> was co-funded by the Visegrad International Visegrad Fund, and we are very thankful for that. Thank and you. we are looking forward also for the next reviews, um, uh, who are also the jury members from uh, the partners organization that will happening, yeah, uh, next next month, probably. Thank you, Tomoya, once Thank again. You,